I'm talking about a mini series on relationships right now. Pastor started a little mini series on relationships last week. And uh, we got life groups coming up. We want to talk about just why life, why, why life groups and why relationships matter. And uh, in uh, Mark 12, 30, they asked Jesus, what's the most important of all the commandments? What, what, what's the most important? I think you're, if you're familiar with church, you may have heard this before. You're aware of it. And Jesus goes, the most important is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with everything. Love God with all you got. But the second is like it. Love your neighbor. What does it say? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's up there. Can you guys read? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So my love for others will be as good as my love for myself. My love for others will be as good as my love for myself. If I'm not healthy, we can't be healthy. Because I bring me into the we. My relationships will be as healthy as the relationship I hold with myself. In every one of your relationships, the only common denominator in all of them is you. So your relationships can't exceed, can't supersede, can't rise above the glass ceiling of your own personal health. So if you're not healthy, if you don't love yourself well, then it's Jesus' words. You can't get mad at me. Don't argue with me. Just argue with Jesus. You can't love others well if you don't love yourself well. So if you talk down to yourself, you're going to bring that energy into your relationships. If you judge yourself harshly, you're going to bring that energy into your relationships. If you can't follow your own boundaries, you probably won't follow their boundaries. Boundaries is a unique thing in our world today. We're just so, who knows what, but you got to understand yours first. This is who I am. I respect myself. uh, My dad would always say when I was growing up, if you hit the snooze button, you started the day lying to yourself. And I was like, that's just obnoxious. I love a good extra eight minutes in the morning. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, that's like the best eight, isn't it? No? It's just, I be, you might have been sleeping eight hours, but you just need that last few minutes. Just, I'm so close. But if you're like, no, I'm going to wake up at six, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to work out, I'm going to get a run in, I'm going to read my word, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, I'm just going to, and then the next morning you're like, no, 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 skip that, skip that, no more reading, no more getting ready, I'm not even going to brush my hair, I'm just going to, I'm just getting out and I'm taking off. Like, at some point you've just started your day, so why? Because you can't even respect your own standards. You won't be able to respect other people's. Many of us struggle loving ourselves, forgiving ourselves, trusting ourselves. And because of that, we struggle with others. Because you can't not bring you into the relationship. And so the issues you have, it's like it's like that person, that young person getting married, like, oh, that person completes me. Like, no, dog, they don't complete nothing. They expose all them issues, but they ain't gonna complete none of them issues. None of my issues were solved when me and Krista got married. It wasn't like, wow, I had all these issues, and she just showed up and just, whew, it was so easy. We had issues. We got to work them out together. It wasn't like, oh, all of a sudden, you know, now we're just. If I bring unhealth, then there's unhealth in the relationship. If I bring untrust, if I bring uh, no discipline, if I bring, like what I'm bringing is there in the relationship. And many of us struggle in relationships and we keep looking out and we don't look in. It starts with you. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. Everything you do flows from it. The New International Version says, guard your heart for everything, all of your life, all of your issues, all of the things that you keep struggling with, getting irritated at, getting frustrated about, all that stuff just keeps flowing out of your, your own heart. That anger, that hurt, that bitterness, that lack of trust, that, uh, that doubt, that 
the small faith, the small dreams of whatever you go, I just wish I could, but I could never, and I could never, and I couldn't do that. Whatever it is that's flowing out of your own. Now, I'm not saying that it's your fault that it's there. Maybe someone hurt you or abused. Maybe something ha happened to you that was wrong. However, it's still in your heart, and everything is still now flowing through it. And many of us approach our life, um, you ever looked at a, like when you're driving a car and a, and a light comes on in your dash? You know, oil change, low tire. It's a dashboard signal, but it's signaling an issue, but that itself isn't the issue. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's, you don't go to the dealership like, hey, I need the, I need the oil light turned off. <laughs> at least you shouldn't. Like, that's not the way to do it. Like, I need that light off. No, you need the oil changed. You, the light is an indicator of the issue. There are things coming out of your heart and you're seeing them in your relationships and it's indicating something that's off or wrong that needs to be fixed, that needs to be dealt with, that needs an oil change. And many of us are mad at the relationship but not dealing with the issue. We're mad at the light indication but we're not dealing with the issue. And so we go from relationship to relationship to the relationship with the same issues, but we don't, we don't change the oil. Like, man, this car drives bumpy. It's like, yeah, because you got three flats. But I got that light turned off. Like, that doesn't matter. They're still flat. You, you have to fix the issue, not the indicator. And many of us get mad at the relationship, but we don't fix the heart. You got to get in your heart because out of it is flowing and you are bringing yourself to every relationship. And so what flows out of you is going to be in that relationship. Relationships start with you. Relationships are going to play a major part of establishing who you are. They're going to set the height and the depth. They're going to set the, they're going to set the, the highs and the lows. They're going to set up. Uh, they're going to sharpen or dull. Relationships are going to create your curve. Relationships will establish who you are. Choose your relationships wisely. Proverbs 13, 20 says that the wise walk with wise. Here, they'll throw it up. He who walks with wise will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. It gets worse. It's not even like wise get get wiser and fools get foolish. It's like, no, the fools actually are destroyed. It's like, wow, that, that escalated quickly. I love that wisdom rubs off. It's contagious. So you get around some wise people and it rubs off on you. You're like, oh, come on, I need, some, I need more of that in my life. Like, let that rub off on me. The problem is foolishness also rubs off. Foolishness also rubs off on you. So, when you're around your friendships, what's rubbing off on you? Think about your, your five closest friends. The five people you connect with the most, talk to the most, let influence you the most. What rubs off on you when you're around them? Because I, I, I truly believe, research is showing that relationships are not a net neutral. It's either a positive or a negative. You're either moving forward or backwards. It's adding or it's subtracting. It's sharpening or it's doling. There's not a neutral relationship in your life, though. Like, you can't just, you can't just excuse someone and you're like, oh, that's just so-and-so. No, no, no. That just so-and-so is either doling you or sharpening you. But they can't just exist off to the side. They're either pulling you down or pushing you forward. They're either allowing you to be average or pushing you to dream bigger. Research has, uh, has shown that right now, if, if someone in your friend's group, in your friend's circle got divorced, you would be 75% more likely to also get divorced. It raises your odds of getting divorced if someone in your friend circle gets divorced by 75%. This, I, I was like, this is amazing. This is gold for a preacher to use. And that's like a secular worldly study. And I was like, my goodness, make my job easier. Guys, what people in your friend circle do rubs off on you. If they're okay getting high every day, 
eventually you'll be okay getting high every day. If they're okay drinking as much as they drink, you'll be okay eventually drink. If they're okay with porn, you'll be okay with porn. If they're okay talking to their wife, you'll, you'll be okay talking down to your wife. If they're okay working overtime and never seeing their kids, you'll also be okay with it. However they act, you'll ultimately start to move towards and accept in your life as well. Why? Because we're, we're so cultural, we're, we do this together with people. God made us to need people. The problem is when you're around the wrong people, you still take on their traits. So if they get divorced, all of a sudden, ah, that's probably okay if we need to, if we get there. If, if they act a certain way, that's probably okay. And their standards are lowering your standards. Single people, if your friends are shacking up, you'll be okay with it. If your friends are living together, you'll be okay with it. Got real quiet. Got real, real, real quiet. They're like, wow, we still believe in that? Yeah, 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 we do. We do. We still believe in that, the whole holiness thing. It's like still a thing in church. Amen. You guys ever played that game, Red Rover, Red Rover? I loved that game. I was a big kid, so I liked it. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I, was, I grew faster than the other kids in my class. So I was like, yes, let's play Red Rover, Red Rover. You know what I'm talking about? You link arms. And then you're looking at the other line. You're like, Red Rover. And you're like, okay, we want we to win. So we got to get some strength over here. So we don't want the, the weakest one, but we don't want someone that's going to come over here and pummel someone. So we need... Red Rover, send Johnny on over. Yeah, we got Johnny. Let's get this guy. Why? Okay, and the deal in the game is it's as strong as your weakest link. Right? Johnny ain't picking the strongest link. Johnny's like, oh, there's the, we- there's the two strongest dudes. I'm just going to bounce off of them. No, he's trying to break through. Here, Antoine and Russell, here, run up here with me. Here, I got my, I got my, see, we got, I picked the best ones. Here, get, walk here. Okay, I got my guys up here. Now, this is, this is, this is life in your relationships. When someone comes at you, what's, what's this guy going to help you with? How are, how are your friends going to help hold you together? If you're having a bad day, are they going to hold tighter? Like, we got you today. We're praying up today. We're working with you today. We're going to lift you. I, I got you in my prayers today. You're not going to fall today. I'm not letting your arm go. If I'm like, oh, I don't think I got it today. They're like, oh, what? Well, well, I guess it. Either way, they're holding on. Because in our friendships, he's like, no, that's not okay for us. We don't talk that way. We don't live that way. We're not accepting that. Hey, where were you at church today? Man, I was tired. I didn't ask if you were tired. I said, where were you? I was looking for you. Why were you not at Life Group last night? Because we're locked up. But let's say one of them starts, oh, we're getting divorced. Oh, hey, we're okay. I've been watching this pornography. I've been, all of a sudden, our, our link gets softer. Just, right, limping it. <laughs> Why? Because I'm locked with my, like my friends are establishing my strength. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Who are you locked up with? Who have you linked arms with? Who is standing next to you being like, no, we're we dreaming bigger today. We, we tithers, but it's, it's tough. God is never the first thing to leave my budget. Like if I'm looking at my budget, the first thing I cut out is not the Lord. <laughs> right, right. It sounds funny when you say, I should say that in my tithe messages more. That is how it is, by the way. If you cut tithe, if you don't tithe, when you, that's how God felt. Okay, budget, cross out God. Because 10% is his. You keep it, you a thief. 10%. You're not even generous. You're just not a thief at 10%. Your friends are like, no, we're stepping up. We're tithers. We're prayer. I, got the, I, love, I love my friends. They'll call me, hey, what'd you get? What, what have you gotten recently? What did you preach on? What's fresh? What's, what's, what's new from the word? I'm like, ah, man, I've been busy. 
I'm like, I'll call you in five minutes, get something fresh. I'm like, what? Five minutes? He's like, yeah, five minutes is enough to read a chapter. Yeah. Open your Bible, read a chapter, call me in five. Click. Better get something fresh really quick. Do you got, a, do you got friends that are like, hey, what you been worshiping with? What's your, what, how have you been seeking God? What's the new thing in your heart? What are you dreaming about? What is your faith moving for? What are you pursuing? What are you going, do you have friends that are trying to move you forward? or dull you back? Who are you locked up with? Friends that are like, no, that's not how we act. So when the devil attacks, when the devil comes at you, you're linked up and no one's breaking through these chains. No one's breaking through this wall because there's a barrier of support because the standard of my life is the, is the, is the five influences I have in my life. So I will rise up to that standard, not fall down to it. What are your friendships? I think many of our friendships are tragically built off of convenience. I think, we, I think more of us have more friends that are coworkers because we're just simply around. We're just around. So I'll talk to you because we're here. See, what that shows us is that you crave connection and relationship. You're just unwilling to do the work to find the right one. So I'm willing to be close to you because you're here. So if you're around me, I'll talk to you. But here's what's, isn't this tragic? The second you get a new job or your coworker gets a new job or someone gets laid off, you never talk again. It's like you poured your heart and soul out to this person only for, only for the relationship to end because you got a new job. It just shows that we really are looking for friendship, but we're just, we're, we're lazy in the process. Proverbs 12, uh, 12, 26, it says to choose your friends with care. The righteous choose his friends carefully. The way of the wicked leads them astray. What do you do with care? What are some of the things that, uh, you hold a baby with care? You're all careful holding the baby? Some of you guys are careful when you clean your cars. You got those old classic cars, or yeah, so you got your boat that you you got something you just handle with with care. Uh, my mom's got some china. Some of you ladies have those china sets, Teresa. You got that china set, nice it's displayed. You know, you know it's nice when the when you don't you never use the dish, but it's displayed. I want you to see the dish, but don't eat off of the dish. That's a nice dish. And and I learned this the other day. Uh, you guys have. Uh, Fabric between the dishes. Each dish has, what, what is it? It's a silk, what is it? V felt. You got that velvet, that felt. Just, 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 it's nice. Each dish has a little fabric between. You, you can't stack these dishes. You must, you must delicately, carefully hand wash and stack them appropriately. Because you handle the things you care about with care. Do you treat your friendships with care? It says, a righteous man chooses his friendships with care. Did you choose your friendships with even as much care as you chose your fantasy team, man? Did you choose your friendships with as much work as you put into choosing a new car? Well, this car gets so many miles. This car goes that. This car gets that. You have a charge at this budget. It gets so many miles to the charge. We have all this research on picking and choosing. Did you choose your friendships with the same energy? Or is it just with well, that guy's around all the time? He laughs at my jokes. Wow, so deep, so careful. Have you chosen your friendships? Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. So a woman sharpens the countenance of her friends. We got a little, little iron ax up in here. Don't worry, it's not ax throwing day. We're just gonna hold it and just. What sharpens you? Do your friends sharpen you? See, the struggle with sharpening, nowadays they sharpen with these stones, so I didn't want to bring two axes and bang them together. It just seemed a little too violent. But 
back in the day when they wrote this verse, they used an iron wheel and it would, they would pump it and just grind the end of an ax and if sparks were flying and it was friction and it was hot, to sharpen something, there's an aggressiveness to it. This isn't a soft, this is, I'm on purpose sharpening this. It's not soft. It's, I don't care about how the axe feels. Oh, did it hurt your feelings? Shut up. And too many of us care more about our feelings than our blade. And we're dull, but we feel good. We have shallow relationships, but we feel good because if you watch my feelings, and God's like, I didn't ask for them to guard your feelings. I asked for them to sharpen you. You know, um, in that verse, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Biblically, if they're not sharpening you, they're not your friend. If they're not sharpening you, they're not your friend. They're your acquaintance. See, in our world today, we got all these Facebook friends. I got 400 friends. No, I, I do not have 400 people sharpening me. I don't have a thousand people sharpening me. I, they're, they're not my friend. We've misused the word friend. They're an acquaintance. I know your name. You're not my friend. And that's not because I don't like you. It's because we're not close. You're not sharpening me. Friendship. Sounds like that. It's harsh. There's, an, there's a realness to it. There's an authenticity to it. There's a, hey, did you read your Bible today to it? There's, I want to push you towards Jesus, not dull you from Jesus. Did you worship today? Have you given today? Have you challenged yourself today? What are you working on? What are you dreaming about? What are your goals? Like, what, how, are you, how are you growing? When was the last time you witnessed? Are you inviting someone to church? How can I help you become a sharper Christian? But this is what most of our friendships look like. Silly putty. Because we just have silly friends that talk about silly things. Hey, have you, have you seen the politics of today? Seems silly. Do you know that I identify myself as paper now? It's just silly. <laughs> Heard worse. It's silly. You know the economy? You know the money? Oh my gosh. I can't even get a starter home anymore. Good for you. Get some friends that challenge how you spend your money. Stop eating out. You no longer have Starbucks in your budget. Don't worry about it. Get over it. Have wisdom. Is Starbucks evil? No, it's just if you don't have money, stop spending it on frivolous things. Have someone that sharpens you. How's your budget? If your marriage is struggling, hey, how's your date nights? What are you talking about? What is the books you're reading? How are you growing? How are you going to change from who you are today to, have, to being a great husband? I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm always doing. Okay, then you'll still have what you've always had. Is there a sharpening happening in your life or is it just same? This is what most of our friendships look like. Just, we didn't sharpen nothing. We just ended up putting silliness on everything. You feel good? You feel really good? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, we feel my feelings. That's what I'm going through. I'm just so stressed right now. So am I. Oh, my gosh. I, I have, I have, uh, I've, I'm clinically anxious. I'm, I have depression. Well, do you have a friend sharpening that? No, just feeling it with me. Okay, so you're going to get duller. Do you have a friend challenging you to read your word more? No, just, just emotional with me. They cried with me, though. And we have men today that look more like this than sharp blades. Because they're not sharpened. They're not challenged. They're not driven. There's no future. There's no big faith in them. And so just, man, I just, just want to, I, you know, I want to change the world, but I'd rather just make a post. Look at how politically awesome I am. I support all these great things. I've never done anything for them, but I'll tell you about them. And, and we have people that look like dull blades because they socially want to make an impact, but they're not willing to go through the work of being a person that actually do anything to bring change, to bring hope, to bring life, 
to bring, to change eternity. Friendships sound tough. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Not only are biblical friendships sharpening, let me say it this way. If they're unwilling to sharpen you, they're not your friend. If they are unwilling or unable to sharpen you, the Bible doesn't call them a friend. Because either they don't have it in them to sharpen you, or worse, they don't see it in you to be sharpened. What are, you, what are the friends in your life doing? And lastly, man can come onto the stage. In Genesis 2, 18, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. God says, the Lord God said, it's not good for man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. As I've, as I've read this verse for years, I always thought that this verse was, was highlighting one issue, but there's actually two issues that God wants to solve in this. You see, I thought that it said that it's not good for man to be alone, and that was the issue that God was trying to solve. Now remember, this is before the fall of man. This is before Adam and Eve eat the fruit and sin and have a disconnect in the Garden of Eden from God and get driven out. This is before sin entered the world, and still in this moment, God is like, there's an issue with the world, and there's an issue with isolation. God saw an issue. He was like, wait, we gotta do something about this. There's an issue with isolation here. But there's a second issue that's solved at the same time. It's, it says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper for him. If isolation was the only issue, he wouldn't have made someone that's a helper. He would have just made someone to be there. That word helper in the Hebrew translate into the same word used in the Greek when Jesus says, I will send you from heaven a helper. So he sends the Holy Spirit to help us. He didn't send the Holy Spirit to walk next to us just so we're not lonely. He sent the Holy Spirit to actually help us in the calling that he has for us. What I'm trying to make sure that you understand in this moment is God is gonna bring relationships into your life, not just to be around you, but to actually help carry the load that you're called to carry. Adam couldn't do it on his own, so God goes, goes I gotta make him a helper, comparable to Adam. He did not, just so you know, he did not make Eve weaker or lesser. He made her a helper comparable to Adam. Why? Because the burden or the calling or the mission that was on Adam was too heavy for Adam to carry alone. The issue wasn't just that he was alone. The issue was he couldn't pull it off by himself. So he needed a helper comparable to achieve all that God had for him to achieve. In our lives, there's a calling on your life that is gonna to be too big and too heavy for you to carry alone. The only way to get to the finish line that God has for you is to do it with the right relationships to carry the load together. That's why you gotta lock arms with the right people because they're helping you carry your load. The, the Bible says that do not be unequally yoked. Do not be, un well, it's just an old, old farm term for it. They would yoke oxen together. They would yoke donkeys together. They would yoke horses. It's just a big wooden tool that would hold these animals together in pairs so they could plow fields or till fields or do some work. But this, 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 this yoke kept them together to work together. The problem was if they yoked the wrong animals together, the work wouldn't get done, or it would detour, or one of the animals wouldn't be able to carry a heavy bur uh, that heavy yoke as long as the other one. So there was always issues making sure that they teamed up the animals correctly so that the work could get done. Many of us have connected ourselves with people not trying to do the load or the work that God has put on us to accomplish. And so we're living our lives with this tension on the inside that says, I feel a burden in me to do this, but everyone around me is pulling me this way. 
But even for Adam in the beginning, God says, I gotta give this guy a helper. This is the first man that God ever created and still he couldn't do everything on his own. He was hand formed and created in a perfect environment without sin, with no issue. God was walking in the garden with him and yet he still needed help to do what God asked for him to do. How much more help do we need to do what God has asked us to do? It's it's through healthy, godly relationships that we're gonna live the lives that God's called us to live. It's gonna sharpen us, it's gonna challenge us, it's gonna stretch us, they're gonna motivate us, they're gonna help carry the burden with us. You see, when we have healthy relationships, then we could get to the finish line that God has for us. We don't think life groups are just a thing that church is supposed to do to check the box. We think life groups matter so much because we want you living the life God has for you to live. We wanna make sure that when you go through it, you're locked up with the right people. We wanna make sure that when when God puts a dream on the inside of your heart, you have the friends that are there to sharpen you and challenge you and motivate you. And you got the group that's there to pray with you and to encourage you and to say that you can do it and God's with you and God is for you. And we wanna make sure that you got a life group that when you got a bad day, someone's there to pray for you. And when your marriage is struggling, they circle the wagons and cover you in prayer and cover you with worship. We wanna make sure that when your kid's in the hospital, you know who to text. Say, listen, I need some prayer right now. We are driving to the hospital. And we want to make sure that you got five and ten people instantly on their face before God saying, heal this child, heal this marriage, bring hope, bring change, bring something, God, that only you can do. But you can't do that if you haven't built it. You got to have healthy relationships so that when you're going through something, someone else is there to help pick up the load and keep you going on the calling that God has for you. Don't do life alone. You can't do life alone. Pick your friends carefully. Pick your friends with wisdom. Pick your friends that are gonna propel you to living the life God's called you to live.